Um, okay, so we're back from the break and um, we will um, now enter the world of um, network and communication, network security. <clears throat> this is covered in domain four. So domain four is basically the state of mind of a network engineer. Now, there's a lot of material that in domain four, you will probably need to memorize. Tough luck, this is what it is, okay? There are lots of information in domain four as you go through the book and as you go through the material, there's a lot of information as always in the CSSP, right? But here we are, we will try to, you know, focus our efforts again, as in any domain, on what's more important than others. What the, the questions that you can expect to get uh, in your CSSP. However, last practice session that we had right before lunch um, showed us that, you know, we will need to elaborate the reading. So I want you to, you know, not just take what you have here in the bootcamp, which is great, you know, it covers a lot, but it's not everything. So I want you to uh, have this state of mind as you go back to studying, you know, um, I, where are the areas that I can elaborate on? Where are the areas that I can I have the opportunity to go to the book, to go to Google and um, extend my knowledge? For example, the um, RSA, um, uh, you know, we went to Google and we asked the question of what it is and we studied this way. So from that point on, that area is covered for us. Um, okay, so bear in mind that, again, bootcamp is great and we cover a lot of information, and we try to give you the focus of what is more important than others and what will most likely be on your exam, but it's not everything, okay? There's a lot of legwork that you guys will need to uh, uh, put in order to actually, um, you know, be 100% ready for your exam. And that's all part of the practice. The questions are there to um, lure you to uh, learn more, okay? to expand your knowledge. Okay, so here in Domain 4, we are at the role of a network engineer, and that's the position that we would like to take in order to understand and think like Domain 4, the, the way Domain 4 wants us to think. Not a lot of materials, two chapters, pretty easy if you know how to separate a lot of noise uh, on network, because, you know, network engineers, network engineering can be a very extensive uh, topic. We can we can have a lot more than just these two chapters, but it's not what we need in order to be a CISO, in order to be a CSSP. So let's focus on that. Um, okay, so here we are, beginning with chapter number 11, Securing Network Architecture and Securing Network Components. So let's start from the beginning. The uh, protocol, what is a protocol? A protocol is basically a language between machines, okay? That's the way machines communicate with each other. And we have different types of protocols. The most common ones for what we are looking at for IT are the TCP and UDP, okay? That's one uh, against the other. And for those, we built the OC model, okay? The OC um, uh, is, uh, 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 the OC model is, we have one for the, um, uh, TCP, uh, one for TCP, one for data, and one for uh, uh, communication layers. And for this one, the main one for the CISSP will be the seven layers OZ module, okay? So the way we want to remember this module is by having at least the acronym memorized uh, in our brain, you know, just go back to that area. Um, so. For this one, for the seven layers, I picked the, the sentence, people don't need to see Pamela Anderson, or Paul, Paul Abdul, or whatever you want. Pamela Anderson, I think is, it's better. Uh, that's the way you actually remember it. Um, so people don't need to see Pamela Anderson. Each one of them represent um, one layer in the OC model from left to right. For the TCP data units, it's the opposite. It's from right to left. Okay, however, the reading is still from left to right in English. Some people are afraid of birthday. So you can choose any acronym you want as long as you remember this seven 
um, emissions, okay? As long as you remember these seven initials, as long as you remember these four first initials, because everything after this is data, I'm okay with this. Okay, so people don't need to see Pamela Anderson and Pamela Abdul, uh, and some people are afraid of birthdays. Just my, uh, um, it works for me, those acronyms, but again, choose whatever works for you. If you're already familiar with this, go with it, okay? As long as you get the, answers, the answer right, because sometimes you will get a question, and that's even level three, what is the fifth layer of the OC model? And you need to know you need to know that the fifth layer is the session. Okay, some people don't need to see see. Okay, so memorize this. Okay, just like the knapsack. Okay, it needs to come quickly. Um, I don't know why they do it this way, but they do, and that's how we need to face those questions. So let's go one by one on the different layers, the seven layers of all, of the OZ model, and from them. We pick those areas that are important for the CISSP. Again, every layer here is a world by itself, and I can talk hours and hours on each one of them and give you examples for each one of them. It's too much for the CISSP. Okay, and the CISSP again, they need to choose from the entire book of 1600 pages the 100 questions that it will ask you. Some of them will be related to this, some of them not. And if they touch on a question on layer one, the physical layer, what you need to consider are the actual cables. So the least secure is the twisted pair, TP cable, and the most secure is the fiber optic. So that's what you need to remember. And then for layer two, what you need to memorize, to remember, not memorize, is the fact that in layer two, data, people don't need to see the data, we do the ARP, the uh, Address Resolution Protocol. For the ARP, we have that ARP that translates, that gives uh, uh, IP addresses for MAC addresses, for the physical address, but also we have a thread called ARP poisoning. So those tables are free for everyone to, um, to publish, and those tables, if they are published correctly, then the movement or the transmissions in our network are done properly, but if they're not, if they mix MEX and, and, and IPs in such way that will be uh, will, will override other ARP tables, then there that's where we have confusion and lack of availability in communication, interruption in communication. So the controls we're looking at are mainly around availability and uh, probably even integrity, the integrity of the ARP tables. Layer three, People don't need, okay, so need is network, stands for network. In layer three, we mainly do the VLANs, virtual LANs. We have the, the network separated. And also here, um, when they ask you what layer is this protocol, this or that protocol, so on this layer, every protocol that starts with the letter I, okay, every protocol that starts with the letter I, ICMP, for example, is in layer three. Every protocol except one. That's the way to remember, okay? So if they ask you what um, what layer is protocol IMAP resides on or, or used in, then your answer is layer seven, right? Because IMAP is the only protocol that starts with I that will be in layer seven. And again, there's a lot of information that we can cover here. I don't want to do that. I think it's a waste of your time and a waste of your energy in studying to the, toward the CSSP. So if you get this type of questions, what uh, layer is this and that protocol? It starts with the letter I and it's not IMAP, then boom, it's layer three. In layer four, we do the SSL and we do the TLS. And this stands from here, layer four, all the way up to layer seven. Here we also do the TCP and UDP. And most questions that you will get around this area and the, the layer four are what are the differences between TCP and UDP? So TCP is more reliable, more secure, but much slower because of the whole handshake situation. And UDP is quicker, but less reliable and less secure. Okay, that's why you, we use it mainly for streaming and gaming and such when we just transmit the information time and time again until it reaches, okay? 
Layer 4 is used for client and server, right? Client and server, email. Email when you have uh, an email client, the Outlook and the Exchange server, right? Web server, you have the web server and you have the browser. So uh, uh, client and uh, uh, server, right? You need to have both. Layer 6, we have no protocol. So no protocol exists in layer 6. What do we have in layer 6? Mainly security, encryption, compression, or key exchange is here. Um, everything that we saw on, on cryptography will probably happen here. Um, but again, no protocol on that one. Okay, so no protocol in layer six. Layer seven is your application layer. Application layer means that this is the interface that the user actually uses. Okay, and this includes the protocols, for example, HTTP and HTTPS, which you can find on the web. And also lots and lots and lots of every, almost every other protocol exists in layer seven. So if you get a question about a protocol that doesn't start with the letter I, okay, and you, you're not sure what, where that protocol exists, guess seven. It's not always seven, but most of the time it will be in layer seven, simply because in layer seven, you have so many options of applications, so each one of them will work on a different protocol, okay? So many, many protocols in the CISSP are in layer seven. Again, unless they start with the letter I, and that one will be layer three, okay, the, uh, the um, network, all right? This is the area where we have a lot of options for networking, starts with an I, layer seven, everything else, including IMAP, all right? Guys, are we good on this? Any questions? No. All right, all right, no. let's continue. Another area that you will need to probably memorize are the uh, protocols and port numbers, right? So um, FTP um, can exist in ports uh, 20 and 21, depends on whether it's a client or a server, SSH port 22 and protocol TCP. But when we look at DNS, okay, domain name server, we can use both TCP and UDP and you will need to remember this. Also, you will need to remember the port 53. And for the DHCP, know that it's always UDP. DHCP is UDP and it uses both ports 67 and 68. This is memorization, okay? We need to memorize this if we don't fully understand or remember this, okay? So this is an area that I think you need to focus on. It's not a whiteboard, but it's definitely something you wanna look at if you're not that um, um, experienced in that area. So the DNS name resolutions means that I have some sort of an IP, you know, I have my own IP and I have my address online, and this is related, this is connected. Much like the ARP table, there is a connection between a number, okay, the IP, and the name that I'm using, okay? And for that one, we have some security issues. For example, the DNS is yeah, uh, UDP based, right? We saw that here, all right, when DNS is UDP based, that means that it's less secure, okay? And the attackers can spoof the response of, a UDP, of the DNS once it responds to the client. So um, by, by uh, understanding this type of security issues, we can understand the need for uh, certificates on our web servers, because that one will create this trust, and this one will enable the use of HTTPS and encryption, which is key to, um, uh, um, you know, uh, protecting ourselves from spoofing. And we've seen that in domain three as well, all right? Going back to the cables and the physical layer, I'm, I'm simply running on this because this is a lot of information that eventually you will need to go back to, take a look again, see that you got the, uh, the, the answers right, the, the questions right, and you know, move on to the next topic. There's not too much to tell about this uh, um, information, about this data. This CSSP is very dry. This part is very dry in the CSSP. A lot of you know, fact, uh, uh, facts and information about that uh, that we cannot, we cannot really do anything with, with it other than 
just, okay, I understand, I remember this, I know network, or I don't, and I need to memorize this. So they do ask us about cable types, okay? And the cable types, different cable types are different uses, but also different lengths and different uh, speeds. So what you need to know is that the base T, 10, uh, 100, and 1000 base T are all uh, in the length of 100 meters. They cannot exist more than this, okay? Also the shielded twisted pair, okay, is also 100 meter length, but the fiber optic is up to 10 kilometers, which makes it more usable, more uh, secure, right? But it's much more expensive. Okay, and it's faster, as we know. Um, the coax cables are basically used for uh, to, uh, today. They're basically used for uh, cable cable TV and such. Um, cate different categories for different cables. Okay, different cables. The uh, uh, unshielded twisted pair uh, cables. We have from category one to category seven. And from this one, um, as you can see, the first two are used for telephony, okay? One for voice over IP, two for telephone, and from that point on, three and all the way to seven, including five and five E for data, okay? So that's basically what you need to remember here. The problems you can have with cables are these. They can be eavesdropping, they can be at attenuation, when you have attenuation, when you have the weakening of the signal, you want to use repeaters, right? So as you advance in the length of the cable, your signal, which is a current, right, electrical current, is weakening. And when you put the repeater, the repeater then enhances that signal, that uh, current, and sends another one. So you can have multiple uh, repeaters in a very uh, lengthy cable. Um, eavesdropping, I think, is the is the main one when look, when we look at the CICSP questions. Everything else is basically understanding the way the cables are, are working. But eavesdropping, you know, if anyone connects your to your um, um, uh, twisted pair uh, cable, then you know if your communication, if the transmission is encrypted, then there's nothing they can do about it. Okay, but still. It's a problem when someone is trying to eavesdrop. If they get the, the key, if they know the encryption algorithm uh, mechanism or system or method, then now they can break your cryptography. So use strong cryptography for uh, communication, channel cryptography, so channel security, and also data security inside that channel. And we talked about that, and we will talk about this again today from a different angle. LAN technologies. When we talk about land technologies, we talk about different, uh, two different uh, aspects, which is one is analog, one is digital. Most of what we see today is digital technologies. And the vast majority of digital technologies today are based on Ethernet. Even so, even though we see the rise in uh, fiber optic uh, uh, technologies, it's on the one wide area network. What we see on LANs, LANs are uh, today, they exist on Ethernet te uh, technology simply because it's cheaper and it's fast today. Equipment on both sides are relatively fast. In, here I am from Israel, from next outside Tel Aviv, speaking to you in Berlin, and we're all working on what? You know, the, 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 um, the copper uh, cables between us, you know? So that pretty, pretty good technology, wouldn't you say? But it's not a fiber, is it? It's not fiber. You're right. talking about the parrot cable? It's a fiber, yes. Is it fiber? I don't get the fiber. Who gets the fiber? Between Israel and Germany, there is a cable somewhere. Of course, is there a cable between Israel and Germany? Really? No, no, not direct, not direct, but the few... Yeah, I think uh, we're connected to, to Cyprus. Yeah. Israel is connected to Cyprus or Greece, I'm not sure. Maybe Cyprus, I think. I can give you the map in a moment. <laughs> anyway, uh, LAN technologies, as I said, either analog or digital. So if we look at the um, LAN technologies from that point of view, 
Uh, there is also here synchronous and asynchronous tra uh, transmissions online technology. Synchronous Cyprus in Italy. Sorry. What's that? Cyprus and Italy. Cyprus and Italy, yes, thank you. Yeah. So synchronous means that we use an external clock. We rely on the, on the world clock for that matter. Okay. And this one, synchronous uh, transmissions are more complex and um, have the greater throughput. That means that you know I give you a call to your number, so now we talk on this dedicated line. But this is you know more complex to to, to maintain, and compared to asynchronous, which is using um, you know kind of BP access quote unquote, or using central uh, locations for calling everybody. You know it's much um, uh, cheaper, simpler, uh, but creates a lot of work to that uh, team that supports us. So asynchronous is for everyone and synchronous is for two dedicated ones that wants to speak with each other. Also, consider these terms baseband and broadband. Baseband, the specific one, the one channel for uh, one digital sign uh, signal, which is good, but is also uh, very limited in distance and the uh, bandwidth is very, uh, it's consumed by a signal, signal single signal, okay? The broadband can encompass more than one basement. So I can have lots of basements in one broadband. Broadband is analog, the distance is longer, and this is basically how they communicate uh, in the country, you know, from one end to another. Uh, we don't necessarily have dedicated lines unless it's uh, military, government uh, officials, or anything like that. So another speaks to in the 90s, the late 90s and early 2000, when we had, um, and we mentioned that for the copyright violations we had back then. Broadcast means that th there's one sender, but the information is being sent to all, or to a lot of servers, a lot of connect connected uh, points, connected uh, receivers. Multicast, can be either one or many talking to many. So unicast is one to one, broadcast is one to many, and, un and multicast is either one or many to many, okay? And this is different needs, different uh, requirements, and different uh, networks, different transmissions that uh, organizations can use. Uh, the transmission protocol called CSMA, CSMA uh, carrier sets multiple access. <coughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> it's basically used as a collision avoidance or collision detection. It's basically there to help us decide whether that communication, that transmission reached their destiny. So CSMA CA stands for collision avoidance and CSMA CD is collision detection. So if we look at the collision avoidance, collision avoidance is a good guy. Okay, he stands there and he looks at the network and he's trying to avoid conflict with other transmissions. Okay, that's when we look for the uh, channel to be ideal, to be clean. Okay, so we can start communicating. Uh, if it's not clean, then we sit aside and we wait for it to be clean. That's the ancient technology. That's before we had fast and, and um, you know, um, very, um, advanced technologies and cheap technology, advanced and cheap technologies that we use this day. So today we actually use the collision detection. And this is the bad boy. It's not the good guy of the uh, communication. This one simply sends their transmission. If their transmission got collided along the way with other transmission, then we will send it again. So this one is CD, collision detection. They, they detected a collision somewhere along the way and they transmit again. So they don't they don't stop, okay? They don't wait. So that's how we can save time, given the right technology and the right um, uh, method that we can actually use. Uh, I have to, to correct into your hand, it's not very, very accurate because okay. CSMACA is still used in Wi-Fi systems where you can't use CSMACD. 
and uh, on the standard uh, wire network, both CSMACD and CSMACA are in place. Uh, especially when you're talking about two computers that connected with a cable, mm -hmm. unless there is a switch in place and then the, the story is a bit different. I, I agree, I agree. I, it's not that we said something different, but I said if you're, we have two points connected to each other, then you can definitely uh, uh, work with the uh, CA. Uh, but when, when you work widely, when you work with a lot of endpoints, you don't have time to wait. You know, we need to transmit the message. But that's, I think we're saying the same thing. <clears throat> so polling, polling will be when we have one bus and, and slaves next to it. So others that are waiting for order to transmit. So we have one primary computer that controls all secondary computers and is polling, is telling them who's going next. Okay, that's another uh, um, transmission uh, technology or transmission method you can expect out there. The Ethernet here, as we can see, we can you know, relate to the CSMA CD as in uh, the uh, used in the Ethernet um, uh, LAN technologies. And for that one, the Ethernet, since it is so wide and so spread, it's so cheap today, but so yet so quick, then it is the by by far the preferred method for LAN technologies today. So what you need to remember is that LAN, good LAN uses today, uses Ethernet, probably uses CSMA CD, given a lot of hosts there, a lot of endpoints there, um, given switches and routers along the way. Um, and to make it more secure, we want to use TCP in it. Okay, so we want to use the protocol TCP most likely. Um, <clears throat> some um, topics or bullet points that we need to cover here, uh, we can have both IP and non-IP protocol. Non-IP protocol, for example, IP protocol, TCP IP, you're all familiar with that. Non-IP protocol, we have, for example, the Apple Talk. Okay, that's another protocol that is designed by Apple and it's uh, used by Apple and it's not a TCP IP. We also have this type of protocols in SCADA and ICS that we mentioned before um, that can also use different protocols that are not this. Um, for example, carriers, uh, so our um, cell phone carriers, um, uh, they use a protocol from the 1970 called SS7, which is not secure at all, used for and there was, there was a, a, a hack in Germany not long ago that um, hackers targeted the SS7 of one of the carriers in Germany and they targeted uh, bank customers that, you know, uh, went through the authentication process with their bank and the bank sent them the SMS with the one-time code. Hackers uh, said on the client side, got their code, because SS7 is, is very weak, it, it's, it's old, it's old technology, and it's not protected by definition. So they got the code and they empty bank accounts for a lot of people in Germany. Not too long ago, I can send you more information about this. This is something you need to consider. And I know that a lot of carriers worldwide are moving away from, um, from trying to move away from SS7 no success there. So it affects the banking industry, it affects the financial industry, which is moving away from sending SMSs, SMS-based authentication, two-factor authentication. Um, so this is something to consider. They banned it long, not long ago in Germany, like uh, last year or two years ago, they, they banned uh, using SMS as uh, two-factor authentication. Oh, really? Uh -huh. wow. It's for the banking industry. Well, probably because of that. Probably because of they are still they are still using SMS for two-factor authentication. I'm getting it for for Mastercard and from Deutsche Bank. They're still using SMS for every transaction, which is more than 500 euros. Really? Yeah. You're supposed yeah. to use photo I also, for it. I also I also have Phototan when I'm using the bank account with the app or in the in the 
in the site itself, but when I'm doing transaction, let's say again that I will transfer or you will bill me for 501 euros, I will get uh, an SMS and I will need to, to respond to this one, that one. Oh, wow. That's OK, um, interesting. That's very interesting. I think, you know, you want, you want to consider another type of uh, uh, two factor authentication. Yeah, but that. this is Visa Protect, no? This is actually, yeah. I think it's a different system. This was a uh, business MasterCard and practically I don't care because I have insurance, so. Yeah, but MasterCard <laughs> is not a bank. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So it's a different, no, it's, it's a different it's platform. A, it's a bank, it's a bank managed and bank issued cards for MasterCard. Uh, it's from the bank. But the protection comes from the card site, you know, it's not from the bank. The protection comes from, I don't care if it's the bank or the card side. I know that it's here in Germany. And yeah. when I change the code in the site, it, it's changing automatically. So it's synced with but the bank. Insurance. So you, you shouldn't care too much about this. Okay, yes, I have, I have, true, a, I have a, um, an article from the 12th of July, 2019. The German banks are uh, to stop using SMS to deliver second uh, factor authentication. Is it immediate? So maybe they didn't deploy it yet, or I want you living in... Uh... Take a bay. Take a bay. They are using I push Germany. I live in Germany. Uh, uh, they are still in the 90s here, so 12 to 2019 is still the future. Actually, the banking is more advanced than Israel, uh, just uh, for to know. Why? Because they're using pin codes? Dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's continue. Let's continue. I'm with Dekabe. They have Pushtan like Duo. It's exactly the same. Super yep. convenient. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Next one, DMZ. Who here is not familiar with DMZ? Shachar. Shachar. No, I'm just putting <laughs> my hands on my uh, chin. That's it. So let me go over this. Okay, the DMZ stands for Demilitarized Zone. Uh, and this is to create a separation between the outside world and the inside world. We you don't mean, have one in... in uh, yeah, don't, 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 no, I don't need to know about this. Uh, uh, I'm joking. Information. <laughs> uh, but what we want to do is create a buffer. Okay? So the DMZ is a buffer between the outside world and the inside world. So it helps us create a separation and, a, and it's a way, it's a method to check every packet or every request that comes from the outside world before it actually enters the, um, the LAN. That's another way to protect your LAN and you have to have it. I think in any organization, you should have at least one DMZ to basically test and filter your incoming transmissions. I don't want to hear about what you not, what you don't have. No, no, no. We have more than one. I'm just kidding. It's okay. We have more than one. Great. I like and, that. And we will have more. No, don't like worry, Kalayan. We will have more than one. We will have three, the three DMS. Uh, oh. Shahar, you are wrong. Three DMS. There will be more. DMZ. Four. Okay, four. Okay. Well, as we store data, we also use networks. We can use, we can store data on the NAS and we can store uh, data on SAN. SAN is much bigger than NAS and it's used by providers, by cloud providers and big organizations. That's why it uses fiber optics. For NAS, for the network attached storage, I can have a NAS uh, on my home computer, on my personal computer, you know, um, and uh, basically the technology is Ethernet simply because it's, it's available, it's cheap, it doesn't require too much uh, work on managing that, and the NAS can exist on Ethernet as well. All right, so... Also, yeah. also SAN can exist on Ethernet, by the way, not only fiber, and SAN can be also on fiber, and yeah. so it can be on fiber, and NAS is the storage itself, which is attached to the network, and SAN is the network. Which network of, of NAS of storage devices, yes, right, right, exactly what, what, what was mentioned here. Um, let's move to wireless, wireless technologies. Where does wireless exist? So it's not just the Wi Fi, it's not just the access point. We also have wireless technology on Bluetooth and cell phones. So anything that is on the air, anything that is not using wired. 
technology. What so about please, NFC? Come again? NFC? I, I don't understand what you say. Three letters, NFC, Near Field Communication. NFC. NFC, yes. And for this, we also have some standards, okay? The A02.11, going from A to N, and recently the AC, okay? So there are different data rates, there are different ranges for indoor and outdoor. You know, indoor is much lower range because of the walls, because of the interruption. And the, op the more open the environment is, the less, uh, the, the wider the range can be. Okay, however, bear in mind that this is over the air. Okay, since it is over the air, it is exposed to a lot of threats. And part of the threats, uh, you know, some of the threats that we are most likely to encounter in the CISSP is a authorized, unauthorized access, which is given, right? It's over the air. If it's not encrypted in any way, shape or form, then you can expect unauthorized access. Also, sniffing is when we try to sniff the packet, sniff the communication between two um, um, uh, two parties that try to communicate. Client server, for example, we try to sniff that communication, even though it's not encrypted. Still, we need to act on it in order to get that information out and act either as the client, as the server, to uh, um, to work on whatever was was sniffed. War driving, war driving is when someone is driving along the street. Okay, or the parking lot, and marks with the chalk on the pavement. Where can we find an open wireless access point? Okay, that's war driving. Someone driving in the street and looking for open access points. Unauthorized access points. That means that we have some sort of unauthorized access points in our network. Okay, somebody connected to our network, an unauthorized access point. And now someone from the outside can connect to our internal network, to our LAN. So what you can do about this is, uh, 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 we call it wireless survey. We will see, we will get to it. And this is a mandatory part of PCI on networks that, um, that actually use Wi-Fi on their CDE. So I'll speak about this more uh, uh, in a few minutes. So what can we do? We can encrypt. Okay, we can use cryptography on our Wi-Fi. However, there are different levels of cryptography. The first one uses, uh, used back then, used WPA. WPA is very weak, and um, it uses uh, the, uh, um, uh, secret, the passphrase secret. It uses um, the RC4 protocol, which algorithm, which is old, which is hackable, and this is not recommended anymore. Uh, throughout the industry. From, um, from WEP, we moved to uh, W, sorry, WEP uses RC4, but WPA still uses the uh, RC4 and uses the secret passphrase in it. Again, not as strong. The WPA was not strong enough, and we moved to WPA2. WPA2 brought in the AES. Okay, the AES, as we know, is a strong cryptography algorithm, which we do want to use, but recently, okay, a couple of years ago, it was also hacked. On your CISSP, if you get a question, what is the strongest mechanism algorithm for, um, uh, to protect your wireless network? And of the options, you have WPA2 as the strongest one, you pick that one. If by any chance ISC Square updated their database, which I don't know that they did, they will probably add WPA3. So if you get that one, choose it. I don't know that ISC included WPA3. Okay, so for them, the strongest encryption mechanism is WPA2, all right? Just like what we said yesterday about TLS 1.2. If you get the 1.3, choose that one. Most likely, they're stuck on 1.2. The same here. Most likely, they're stuck, they're still stuck on WPA2. We all good? Yeah. All right. So part of your PCI DSS requirements, as I mentioned before, 
is to run a wireless survey, site survey. That means that you go with your laptop with a with the software, the software can be found anywhere to scan your network for access points. So you walk around the building, and if this, if this is your, just your organization's building, then you should be able to control the access points. But if you share the building, which is most likely, you have other neighbors in the building, then you probably capture their network. So on this one, what we want to do is to map the access points that we have on the network and if there is an, an access point that we're not aware of, we we're not we're not familiar with, um, then we have to investigate and you know find out if this is a wrong access point or um, you know somebody connected unauthorized access point to our network. Yes, Valentino, I'm with you. So based on the survey thing as well, <clears throat> a lot of the a lot of the wireless companies, for instance, Cisco and um, um, what's this, uh, Ruckus. They, they actually have a thing called Rogue AP Detector right. built into the access points. Right. So if, if it picks up an access point that's not part of the network, it actually isolates that zone it's for disconnect. you. Right. So yeah, just side note. Yeah. Um, I would like to add to that side note that in part of the countries, containment of a rogue access point inside your network, even inside your building, is not legal. In Germany? Yeah. Also in Germany, yes. By the way, also in Israel. Really? Containment of an access point inside your network, even inside your building, uh, is not is not legal. And uh, by the way, some of the uh, Wi-Fi provided also ammunition to fight this rogue access point, and this is also uh, an offensive uh, action and it's not uh, legal in most of the countries i i really hope so i really hope that this is the case and you know um this those criminals are being prosecuted uh um in court uh but to tell you the truth i'm very i have doubts in this i'm not sure if this can be actually executed um you know, given the fact that your wrong access point can come from from an employee you know they simply connect their phone yes you know i i'm saying i'm saying that to fight this rogue access point with uh, mm -hmm. wi-fi technology so containment and uh, and uh, uh, the name it's called i don't know but there is a offensive technique also to to bombard this uh, access point and then mm -hmm. uh, crush it both actions are not legal in most of the countries oh interesting interesting all right, <clears throat> how do we protect our Wi-Fi, our wireless? We can do MAC filtering. We're all familiar with this. That's why I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But MAC filtering is entering all MAC addresses to your access point and saying anything that is not that, do not allow to connect. Also, you can hide your SSID. And this is highly recommended for anyone that is concerned about security. You know, hide your SSID. The first one can be easily spoofed and the second one can be easily revealed. Yes, right, that's true. And also, if you use that uh, software for the site survey, for example, you have Insider, right? This will tell you about hidden SSIDs. Um, so easily revealed, yes, I agree. But, you know, what we want to do is make sure the vulnerability is not as obvious to the potential hacker. They will need to work on it. As they work toward finding out more information about a vulnerability, Hopefully, we'll be able to detect them, all right? We'll, they will trigger an alert somewhere and we'll be able to detect them. So um, network devices, again, in your CSSP can be any one of these. And if you're not familiar with anyone with, with one of these or more, I highly encourage you go to the book, you go online, you do your research, because this is pretty obvious. Hubs, bridges, repeaters, bottoms, proxy server, proxy used for um, uh, you know, caching your internet traffic and make it quick and easy for your users to, to browse the network. Firewall routers, switches, gateways, all the same language around network and network devices. And again, if you're not familiar with one or more of this, I highly recommend on going online and looking it up and studying more about it. The last slide here for um, chapter 11 in, the, um, in our book is about firewalls 
and firewalls on those in those layers of the OC model. I know that some of you will disagree with part of what is said here, but this is a representation of ISC and CSSP. Okay. We have firewalls in layers three, five, or seven. That's it. Okay. Um, let's start with the first one. Layer three, static packet filters. This one is a very simple, very um, a very basic firewall to make a decision on based on the source and destination IP addresses and ports that that transmission is using currently. Okay, so it analyzes source destination, it says I, I'm familiar with this, I'm familiar with that, I have a rule saying this is allowed, this protocol, and that's it, move away. Layer five is Layer five, we have two. We have stateful inspection and we have secret level gate. The stateful in inspection um, is looking at the session and it can bl block unsolicited replies. Unsolicited replies, okay? So this one is somewhat uh, in, a, in, a, in a slightly better position than the static packet filter. However, we it's not as smart as um, either secret level gate, right? proxies application uh, firewall that we can see that we can find in layer seven. The secret level gateway, um, it works again on the session layer, okay, uh, layer five, and then it monitors the TCP handshaking between the packets. So it determines whether the requested session is legitimate. So it works on the session itself. It doesn't look on the application, just ask, is this session, is the right session for my organization Maybe on a based on a rule set that says, in this time of the day, this session is expected. This time of the day, we we do not expect these sessions to take place. And last one, and is the strongest one and most recommended one that we have out there, is the application firewall or application proxy. This one looks directly on the application that is used on that transmission and analyzes application by application based on behavior, based on source and decision, based on anything else that we can look for. And this one is the one that makes most sense to our SIM system. It provides logs that are far smarter than any other uh, firewall out there. And you want to rely on this firewall to make your decisions on whether you detect an incident or this is just what we call white noise on your SIM. Um, yes. The second one is practically not true. This is a science. It's not an assumption. And it's stateful inspection is based on layer three and four. It's inspected in layer three and inspection inspecting layer four, not layer five. I don't know who wrote it, but it's the, the, totally. Do you, remember what, do you remember what I mentioned at the beginning of the slide? I remember, but I, but I prefer to act. I prefer to to to, to know that I'm right than. Okay. To, to, to act like an idiot just to pass an exam. All right. I want you to pass the exam. Yes, I understand, but one plus one is two, not three. I, I know. I know. So wh wh what that's you just said, I, that all CISSPs are I idiots said, because they're no, thinking... No, 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 that's not what I said. What I'm saying again, for you to pass the CISSP, do not go to layer, set, to layer four on firewall. Okay? Stick with layer firewall resides. I I cannot it's, argue with it's you. It's totally it's, bullshit. Sorry, it's totally come on, bullshit. Come on. We, we all think this way, and there's some stuff that we don't agree with, but we don't have a what do you have to do? I mean, what can you do? That's the thing, that's the problem. And that's part of the problem that I mentioned when we started this bootcamp. Do we escalate it? Do we need to escalate it to the idiots who wrote the exam, for example? <laughs> okay, I can give it a try. I can give it a try. You know what? I'll share the response with you. Thank right? you. <laughs> I will. I promise I will. All right. This was chapter 11. Okay. Um, do you guys need a break? Yes. Yeah, you do. After the previous year one, yes, of course. 10 minutes. <laughs> the, the last slide killed me.
10 minutes. Yeah, Aaron needs to, uh, uh, to breathe again. Yeah, let's, do, let's do 20 minutes because I have a couple of phone calls people I need to get back to. So let's do 20 minutes. Uh, 3, 3, 10. Okay? okay. 3, 10. We'll be back. Thank you. All right, guys. See you soon.